And now chapter 6, why Duryodhan felt insulted at the end of the Rajasuya sacrifice. King Yudhishthir was known as Ajata Shatru, or a person who had no enemy. Therefore, when all the men, demigods, kings, sages, and saints saw the successful termination of the Rajasuya Jagya performed by King Yudhishthir, they were very happy. That Duryodhan alone was unhappy was astonishing to Maharaj Parikshit and therefore he requested Sukhdev Goswami to explain this. Sukhdev Goswami said, My dear King Parikshit, your grandfather, King Yudhishthir, was a great soul. His congenial disposition attracted everyone to be his friend, and therefore he was known as Ajata Shatru, one who never created an enemy. He engaged all the members of the Kuru dynasty in taking charge of different departments for the management of the Rajasuya sacrifice. For example, Bhima Sain was put in charge of the kitchen department, Duryodhan in charge of the treasury department, Sahadev in charge of the reception department, Nakul in charge of the store department, and Arjun in charge of looking after the comforts of the elderly persons. The most astonishing feature was that Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, took charge of washing the feet of all the incoming guests. The Queen, the Goddess of Fortune, Draupadi, was in charge of administering the distribution of food, and because Karna was famous for giving charity, he was put in charge of the charity department. In this way, Satyaki, Vikarna, Hardikaya, Vidura, Burishrava, and Santardan, the son of Bahilik, were all engaged in different departments for managing the affairs of the Rajasuya sacrifice. They were all so bound in loving affection for King Yudhishthir that they simply wanted to please him. After Shishupal died by the mercy of Lord Krishna and merged in the spiritual existence, and after the end of the Rajasuya Jagya, when all the friends, guests, and well-wishers had been sufficiently honored and rewarded, King Yudhishthir went to bathe in the Ganges. The city of Hastinapur stands today on the bank of the Yamuna, and the statement of Srimad Bhagavatam that King Yudhishthir went to bathe in the Ganges indicates, therefore, that during the time of the Pandavas, the river Yamuna was also known as the Ganges. While the king was taking the Avabrita bath, different musical instruments vibrated, such as madrangas, conch shells, drums, kettle drums and bugles, and the ankle bells of the dancing girls jingled. Many groups of professional singers played vinas, flutes, gongs, and cymbals, and thus a tumultuous sound vibrated in the sky. The princely guests from the many kingdoms, like Srinjaya, Kamboj, Kuru, Kakaya, and Koshal, were present with their different flags and gorgeously decorated elephants, chariots, horses, and soldiers. All of them passed in a procession with King Yudhishthir in the forefront. The executive members such as the priests, religious ministers, and Brahmins performed a sacrifice and all loudly chanted the Vedic hymns. The demigods and the inhabitants of Pitralok and Gandharvalok, as well as many sages, showered flowers from the sky. The men and women of Hastinapur, Indraprastha, their bodies smeared with scents and floral oils, were nicely dressed in colorful garments and decorated with garlands, jewels, and ornaments. Enjoying the ceremony, they threw on each other liquid substances like water 
oil, milk, butter, and yogurt. Some even smeared these on each other's bodies. In this way they enjoyed the occasion. The professional prostitutes jubilantly smeared these liquid substances on the bodies of the men, and the men reciprocated in the same way. All the liquid substances had been mixed with turmeric and saffron, and their color was a lustrous yellow. In order to observe the great ceremony, many wives of the demigods had come in different airplanes, and they were visible in the sky. Similarly, the queens of the royal family, gorgeously decorated and surrounded by bodyguards, arrived on different palanquins. During this time, Lord Krishna, the maternal cousin of the Pandavas, and his special friend Arjun, were both throwing the liquid substances on the bodies of the queens. The queens became bashful, but at the same time their beautiful smiling brightened their faces. Because of the liquids thrown on their bodies, the saris covering them became completely wet. The different parts of their beautiful bodies, particularly their breasts and their waists, became partially visible because of the wet cloth. The queens also brought in buckets of liquid substances and sprinkled them on the bodies of their brothers-in-law. As they engaged in such jubilant activities, their hair fell loose and the flowers decorating their bodies began to fall. When Lord Krishna, Arjuna, and the queens were thus engaged in these jubilant activities, persons who were not clean in heart were agitated by lustful desires. In other words, such behavior between pure males and females is enjoyable, but it makes persons who are materially contaminated become lustful. When King Yudhisthira, in a gorgeous chariot yoked by excellent horses, was present there along with his queens, including Dropadi, their features were so beautiful that it appeared as if the great sacrifice Raja Surya were standing there in person, along with the different functions of the sacrifice. Following the Raja Surya sacrifice, there was the Vedic ritualistic duty known as Patni Samyaj. This sacrifice, which was performed along with one's wife, was also duly performed by the priests of King Yudhishthir. When Queen Draupadi and King Yudhishthir were taking their Avabrita bath, the citizens of Hastinapur, as well as the demigods, began to beat on drums and blow trumpets out of feelings of happiness, and there was a shower of flowers from the sky. When the king and queen finished their bath in the Ganges, all the other citizens, consisting of all the Varnas or castes, the Brahmins, Kshatriyas, the Vaishyas and the Shudras took their baths in the Ganges. Bathing in the Ganges is recommended in the Vedic literatures because by such bathing one is freed from all sinful reactions. This is still current in India, especially at particularly auspicious moments. At such times, millions of people bathe in the Ganges. After taking his bath, King Yudhishthir dressed in a new silken cloth and wrapper and decorated himself with valuable jewelry. The king not only dressed himself and decorated himself, but also gave clothing and ornaments to all the priests and the others who had participated in the jagya. 
In this way, he worshipped them all. He constantly worshipped his friends, his family members, his relatives, his well-wishers, and everyone present. And because he was a Vaishnava, a great devotee of Lord Narayan, he knew how to treat everyone well. The Mayavadi philosophers endeavor to see everyone as God is an artificial way towards oneness. But a Vaishnava, or devotee of Lord Narayan, sees every living entity as part and parcel of the Supreme Lord. Therefore, a Vaishnava's treatment of other living entities is on the absolute platform. As one cannot treat one part of his body differently from another part, because they all belong to the same body, a Vaishnava does not see a human being as distinct from an animal, because in both of them he sees the soul and the super-soul seated simultaneously. When everyone was refreshed after bathing and was dressed in silken clothing and jeweled earrings, flower garlands, turbans, long wrappers, and pearl necklaces, they looked all together like the demigods from heaven. This was especially true of the women, who were very nicely dressed. Each wore a golden belt around the waist. They were all smiling, with spots of tilak and curling hair scattered here and there. This combination was very attractive. Those persons who had participated in the Rajasuya sacrifice, including the most cultured priests, the Brahmins who had assisted, the citizens of all the Varnas and the kings, demigods, sages, saints, and citizens of Pitriloka, were all very much satisfied by the dealings of King Yudhishthir, and at the end they happily departed for their residences. While returning to their homes, they talked of the dealings of King Yudhishthir, and even after continuous talk of his greatness, they were not satiated, just as one may drink nectar over and over again and never be satisfied. After the departure of all the others, Maharaj Yudhishthir restrained the inner circle of his friends, including Lord Krishna, not allowing them to leave. Lord Krishna could not refuse the request of the king. He therefore sent back all the heroes of the Yadu dynasty, like Samba and the others. All of them returned to Dvorka, and Lord Krishna personally remained to give pleasure to the king. In the material world, everyone has a particular type of desire to be fulfilled, but one is never able to fulfill his desires to his full satisfaction. King Yudhishthir, because of his unflinching devotion to Krishna, could fulfill all his desires successfully by the performance of the Raja Surya Jagya. From the description of the Raja Surya Jagya, such a function appears to be a great ocean of opulent desires. Such an ocean is not possible for an ordinary man to cross. Nevertheless, by the grace of Lord Krishna, King Yudhishthir was able to cross it very easily, and thus he became freed from all anxieties. When Duryodhan saw that Maharaj Yudhishthir had become very famous after performing the Rajasuya Jagya and was fully satisfied in every respect, he began to burn with the fire of envy because his mind was always poisonous. For one thing, he envied the imperial palace constructed by the demon Maya for the Pandavas. The palace was excellent in its puzzling artistic workmanship and was befitting the position of great princes, kings, or leaders of the demons. In that great palace, the Pandavas lived with their family members, and Queen Draupadi served her husbands very peacefully. And because in those days Lord Krishna was also there, the palace was also decorated by his thousands of queens. 
when the queens with their heavy breasts and thin waists moved within the palace and their ankle bells rang very melodiously with their movement, the whole palace appeared more opulent than the heavenly kingdoms because a portion of their breasts was sprinkled with saffron powder, the pearl necklaces on their breasts appeared reddish. With their full earrings and flowing hair, the queens appeared very beautiful. After looking at such beauties in the palace of King Yudhishthir, Duryodhan was envious. He was especially envious and lustful upon seeing the beauty of Draupadi, because he had cherished a special attraction for her from the very beginning of her marriage with the Pandavas. In the marriage selection assembly of Draupadi, Duryodhana had also been present, and with other princes he had been very much captivated by the beauty of Draupadi, but had failed to achieve her. Once upon a time, King Yudhishthir was sitting on the golden throne in the palace constructed by the demon Maya. His four brothers and other relatives, as well as his great well-wisher, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna, were present, and the material opulence of King Yudhishthir seemed no less than that of Lord Brahma. When he was sitting on the throne, surrounded by his friends, and the reciters were offering prayers to him in the form of nice songs, Duryodhana, with his younger brother, came to the palace. Duryodhana was decorated with a helmet, and he carried a sword in his hand. He was always in an envious and angry mood, and therefore, on a slight provocation, he spoke sharply with the doorkeepers and became angry. He was irritated because he had failed to distinguish between water and land. By the craftsmanship of the demon Maya, the palace was so decorated in different places that one who did not know the tricks would consider water to be land and land to be water. Duryodhana was also illusioned by this craftsmanship, and when crossing water, thinking it to be land, he fell down. When Duryodhana, out of his foolishness, had thus fallen, the queens enjoyed the incident by laughing. King Yudhishthir could understand the feelings of Duryodhana, and he tried to restrain the queens, but Lord Krishna indicated that King Yudhishthir should not restrain them from enjoying the incident. Krishna desired that Duryodhana be fooled in that way, and that all of them enjoy his foolish behavior. When everyone laughed, Duryodhana felt very insulted, and his hair stood up in anger. Being thus insulted, he immediately left the palace, bowing his head. He was silent and did not protest. When Duryodhana left in such an angry mood, everyone regretted the incident, and King Yudhishthir also was very sorry. But despite all occurrences, Krishna was silent. He did not say anything against or in favor of the incident. It appeared that Duryodhana had been put into illusion by the supreme will of Lord Krishna, and thus was the beginning of the enmity between the two sects of the Kuru dynasty. This appeared to be a part of Krishna's plan in his mission to decrease the burden of the world. King Parikshit had inquired from Shukdev Goswami why Duryodhana was not satisfied after the termination of the great Rajasuya sacrifice, and thus it was explained by Shukdev Goswami. Thus ends the Bhaktivedanta purport of the third volume, sixth chapter of Krishna, why Duryodhana felt insulted at the end of the Rajasuya sacrifice.